Hey guys, Ty Bryson here, and today we're doing a book review on how finance works. And here's the book right here, and it's by Mihir Adesai. And by the way, I got to say something, guys, okay? This is the book that I got, and I wasn't planning on getting it initially. But let me tell you the story about how I actually got this book. And by the way, it's more of a little summary of the book. And I'm going to go through the chapters here that he actually has available just to tell you exactly what you might find in it. But overall, here's what I will say. Um, initially, I was going to take a course, an online course, obviously, in Harvard. And when I looked at the price, it was like $1,750. And this author right here, Mahir, he was basically one of the teachers, one of the professors there. And I said to myself, well, I could either pay $1,750 to take this guy's course, or I could just basically buy his book for like $20, $25. And the answer became very obvious, okay? Because one required me to spend weeks um, taking a course, and the other one required me just to buy a book and kind of just go through it and see exactly what this guy had to say when it comes to financial markets and everything like that. Now, what I did, obviously, is I, I bought the book, obviously, and I have the book, and I went through it. And this right here is one of the most simple ways to explain finance that I have heard in my entire life. I love this book. However, here's what I will say. If you're trying to read this book to learn how to analyze a company, you will finish this book and be dangerous enough or know just enough to be dangerous, okay? Because he it's kind of like it's kind of like a version of the intelligent investor without like the concrete ways of investing when it comes to the mindset. It's more like the mathematical aptitude that it takes to basically be an investor. So he teaches you in this book. I'll tell you more later, but the idea is it's a mathematical, simplistic way to understand how to value a company and everything that goes into finance and capital allocation. And it's exactly what I was looking for. However, here's what I will say. If you are a reader and you're trying to become, for example, a stock picker, just trying to be a better person when it comes to understanding finances, this is a great book for you. I, I really do believe that. But there are some flaws in here. There are flaws, for example, when it comes to the appropriate discount rates. There are flaws, for example, when it comes to issuing um, more, more, more shares out there. Does it dilute the shares? And you know, there are some flaws in here in the way he thinks. But I don't think it's flaws. I think more it's just different ways to kind of get to the same purpose. For example, the way Warren Buffett thinks about an investment is the way he thinks about an investment. The way he thinks about an investment is different from what Warren what, what Buffett thinks, okay? And there will be things that I will disagree with Warren Buffett and also him, but what I wouldn't do is try to read this book or any other book and just basically take on that person's entire aptitude for investing because that's a terrible idea because you want to form your conclusions and practice and kind of just get to the, the understand what's going on. But the only way to get there is to learn from the masters. And this guy right here is definitely very good at being a professor and teaching finance overall. Now, you're expecting here what I loved about this book, honestly. And I smile because I wish I had a professor like this back in my school, in my college. But I didn't, okay? But what I love about this book is that it's not just a book. It felt more like a textbook. And it didn't feel just like a textbook where it's boring. It also felt like a novel. And it sounds weird and I sound like a nerd saying it, but I was very entertained reading this book until I wasn't because I was very sleepy at one point. But overall, the book was very entertaining. Like I actually had fun and there were so many good examples in this book telling you, hey, here's what I just taught you, but here's an example how about how you can use it in the real life. And then here's the CEO that tells you exactly how he approaches it when it comes to his investments and that to me, is priceless. And then once you're done with every chapter, which by the way, is just about six chapters, honestly, not that much at all, then he gives you a quiz. And the quizzes are usually just 10 questions. I went from, I, I never failed the quiz. Um, I got C's and B's. I don't, I, C's and B's and A's. I got some, I got like an A or two or so. But one thing I understand is that the overall goal with this book is to make you better at understanding finance and to really simplify it. And that's what I loved about this book. It's kind of like a teacher being right behind you or right next to you telling you this and that and this and that. And he did a very good job at breaking things down, especially for me because I based them more like a visual learner. So not having that visual professor telling me this and that. He basically broke things down where it does feel like that. So this guy is amazing. But overall, you're going to find in here six chapters. The first chapter is going to be financial analysts um, using ratios to analyze performance all while playing a game. And the thing is, 
how do you understand financial ratios, like P ratios, like um, um, turnover ratios? Um, uh, there's there's so many of them, okay. But what do these ratios actually mean? How do you use them when you're analyzing a business? And how do you use them, for example, as a business, or for example, as a supplier, or for example, as an investor? It's about using all these ratios to fully understand it and kind of trying to play a game while he teaches you um, exactly how to use this stuff. And his whole idea is he shows you all these companies and tells you, hey, which company is this one, and which ratio sounds like it's more likely to be this company or that company. Like you're gonna have fun with this part of the book. Chapter two, the finance perspective. Why finance is obsessed with the cash and also the future. Everything in finance is cash and future because the only way to value a company is to understand how much cash this business is gonna give you over a long period of time. And the future is important because you're trying to predict the future with a sense of accuracy, which none of us can do actually, right? Because it's kind of impossible. But the only way to predict the future is to look at the past and say, hey, if this company, statistically, numerically, basically on paper has told us it's made this much money over the past 10 years, we can expect this company to probably stay competitive and make more money over the next few years, okay? So it's about using the past to give you a better idea of the future and understanding what cash actually is and why cash is so important. Cash is everything. If a business makes, for example, $3 trillion in sales, and it basically has left in free cash flow zero, the answer is it's trash because there's no money left over. Like all the money has to be used up to make more money or to keep the business actually floating. But there's no actual value being given to us. Like it's me like having a business. It's like a lot of those people that started a business, guys, you know those people like they have a gas station, they have a deli, they have a, um, what is it, what? a coffee place, they have a restaurant, and all of a sudden, you ask them, where's the money? And they're like, I don't know where the money is. Like, I just work here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's no cash coming out of the business. And that's not what you want whatsoever. Chapter three is about the financial ecosystem. Understanding the who, the why, and how capital markets basically works. And again, it's exactly what it sounds like. He breaks down, well, who are we as sellers? Who is actually buying? What is the whole financial markets? And what's the big problem here? And I never thought about it, but the big problem is the information disconnect. Where, this is actually very interesting, but... He gives this example, which I actually love and I actually like so much, and it's that if me and you were to enter a gamble, a wager, and I told you, if you can guess how much money I have in my wallet, and we're both going to gamble on this, then you get X amount or I get X amount. Like, how can you gamble with me when it's my wallet and I know exactly how much money I have in it? It's exactly when it comes to buying a company. There's this information that caught on me because, for example, you have the brokers, the analysts and the companies and then when you have us we're trying to buy the companies right so you have all this stuff but between the actual company and us the investors why do you have this big middle of brokers and analysts and institutions that basically are doing everything to be the middle person like why won't why can't i just go to coca-cola and be like hey here's a thousand dollars i want to buy some shares that's it well because as an investor i don't know much about what that company is basically doing like they know a lot more of what they have and what they don't have so the analyst has a job of saying hey I'm going to get all this information to give to us to basically have a better understanding. But then you kind of understand that the analysts have the wrong incentives because if they give a company, like sell this company, right? That's the that's the whole, like, that's what the analysts recommend. Then automatically that company's managers might not talk to that analyst. And then that analyst has, for example, the way they make money is by having those connections, right? And being important. So you have this massive, and there's this other thing that basically says, when you have the twisted, when you have twisted interests, right, it's very problematic. It's like there's a statistic in here that says I think um, an average a real estate agent sells their house for like twelve percent than they would, for example, for somebody else. And the reason is because it's for themselves, right? So when it's for some, it's, when it's for yourself, you're probably gonna do a better job than you would, for example, for your customer. So the big thing here is understanding the information disconnect and you trying to basically take advantage of that via the market. It's, it's pretty interesting when you think about it. And I like the book, man. It's really good. So now chapter four is sources of value creation. The only way to create value is by investing into projects that basically have a net present value. And what that basically means is that you can issue out more shares. You can do share buybacks. You can do this. You can do that. But if it's not actually creating any value, then as far as, for example, if I'm going to invest a dollar into a project that is basically going to make me X amount of money. But once I get the net present value, it's a negative number which tells me, hey, this pro this project is basically not, not a good project. Then it makes no sense because it basically just destroys value. Value is created by investing into things that have a net present value. That's the idea. It's like basically making 
profitable investments. And you can have two ways of doing that. Organically, where you're basically investing into, let's say, factories or, or for example, better ways to produce something. Or the on inorganic way, which is basically when you do mergers and acquisitions where you think that's faster. So you buy this company to have synergy because if you have one company here plus my company, we combine and all of a sudden we're so much perfect. But there's a disconnect there because you have different cultures, different class, management can be bad and it cannot work out. There's a lot, it could be hard at implementing. There's a lot of things in this book, man, that make you think. And it's kind of like, if you read a lot of books when it comes to stocks and so on, it just reaffirms everything a lot more, but also gives you numbers. Because one big thing that I've never liked about Warren Buffett is that he has a very good way of saying things and breaking things down, but he doesn't ha he doesn't tell you what he figures. He doesn't tell you, hey, here's exactly what I do to do this. And I understand it and why he doesn't do that, because it's kind of like somebody telling you, hey, um, I don't have a patent on this. There's no protection on what I do. So let me give you my exact valuation formula. Like he's not going to do that, obviously, because he still uses it, right? So it makes no sense. And plus, it's, it's subjective anyways, but he's not going to tell you all the secrets. And I, I, I like that. I like that because but he does tell you what it is, but you got to figure out how to adjust it for yourself. Though. I, I love Warren Buffett, man. Um, so then you have, for example, chapter five, which is the art and science of valuation. And it goes into how to value a home, an education, a project, or a company. And it teaches you exactly how to discount cash flows, okay? And it tells you step by step how you can use an Excel sheet, how you can account for taxes, how you can account for cost of capital, how you can account for all these things. And you can, it's, it's, a, it's a great book on how to analyze things. But one thing I will say is, guys, when I say this book makes you just like know enough to be dangerous, it really does. Because you can basically easily just go on Excel or Excel or Google Sheets, I'm sorry, and just basically just create yourself a little sheet and do some net present value calculations and be like, well, this stock is undervalued because this and that, but you don't understand the business, right? And you're like, well, I can buy it right now for this price and I'm gonna make some money. It's like when I first read The Intelligent Investor and I found out the perpetual, what's, what's that formula called? Perpetual cash flow formula, which is basically um, the cash flows divided by um, one plus R. Is that is that the formula? No, it's, it's one, it's, it's, I think it's R minus growth, yeah. Yeah, so it's R minus growth, so it's um, cash flows, um, divided by um, R, which is your cost of capital or your discount rate minus the growth. And it tells you perpetually exactly what the terminal value is. But it's it's pretty cool stuff. But like once you figure that out, you kind of go out there, you try to do it and you find yourself in companies, but you don't understand them. And the, my point is like the math is not enough. The math is not enough. Okay. If it was enough, then all the mathematicians would be wealthy and we would be poor. Okay. The math is not enough. Okay. Um, number, number six, the final chapter is all about capital allocation. And it's basically not from an investment point of view, and it kind of comes from, example, from a management point of view. And that's really, it's interesting, but I would have loved it more if you would have gone more into perspective as far as like us instead of, for example, just like the management. But it's, it's cool. I don't really care. But it kind of tells you exactly when it comes to management, you have this kind of like allocation tree, which is you have a company that has some cash and then they have two things to do with it, which is basically give it to the customers or invest it into, for example, some um, opportunities that give you, for example, a net present value, okay? And, and it's pretty cool stuff, right? So it basically means that a company should only be given out dividends or, for example, issuing share buybacks, which, by the way, is just a way, uh, it's, it's so interesting, right? But it really does start to make sense here. When a company does, for example, um, issues out a dividend, it's because they don't have other opportunities to add more value to the company because dividends don't add value to the company. Share buybacks don't add value to the company. It just basically means you, you have a little bit more ownership of, of the pie because now the pie has shrinked a little bit, right? It, it's, that's the idea. And then, for example, if you want to, if the company does have some opportunities, then it needs the cash to invest in those opportunities to basically make us more money. But one thing that I will say is that the, the big thing is that for us as investors, when a company is holding on to a lot of cash and they have not a lack of opportunities, but you have management that's just not good at making these acquisitions or, for example, these investments, then obviously the cash is better off in our hands. Okay, so that's also a big part of it. But guys, that is it for this video, man. Um, six chapters. It's solid. It's good. It's a good book. I recommend it. It's, I think, um, 223 pages is what it is. It took me about a week or so to actually read this book. I think it was. Um, I read very slow, so I dedicated to it like about like um two three hours a day. I basically <laughs> read slow. I'm telling you, but I dedicated for like, like three hours a day. But it's one of those books that you can't read. 
per se, you have to take notes as you write it. So as I basically, um, as you basically read the book, not writing, not writing the book, not the author, but as you write, as you read the book, you got to take a lot of notes and you got to write all those things down because there are a lot of formulas, man. And one thing I learned, like learned from Jim Ron is that when it comes to trying to learn something, don't rely on the mind rely on just practice so just putting things down and by the way i have i have all my results here for for um the quizzes here i got a c on one chapter i got an a on another chapter a c on another chapter a c I, I didn't fail one though okay i didn't fail one though but it's tricky and here's what i will say guys um this guy's intelligent he's a professor but uh, some of the academic ways of thinking about finances and investments they're wrong so it's important that you read this to get the good stuff and it's important that you know enough about money to get the bad stuff out of your head because there is some bad stuff here. Um, for example, WAC, which is the weighted average of capital um, cost of capital, it tells you, well, how much do you discount the, 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 um, the cash flows by, right? And that's one thing. But then in reality, Warren Buffett just says, hey, just, just discount it by the average bond yield over the past 10, 30 years or whatever. And that should be enough because you're already accounting for the risk because you're finding the company with predictable cash flows. But people that do educational stuff, they don't think about it that way. They just have some fancy formula to calculate things. So if, if you read this book and you don't know enough about money and finance and stock investing, um, like we all do because it's a long life process, then you read it, you take notes of everything, you understand everything, but then you have to also read other books about money and finance to actually get a full perspective and to kind of get it. My best strategy is always find the person you admire the most and basically base it on, on, on that. That's that's really what I do. Um, guys, thanks for watching this video. As always, like, subscribe, hit the bell to get notified. Comment down below if it was helpful. Let me know if you're actually going to get this book. And again, I'm going to show you guys this book right again right now because, again, this, this guy, man, is a very phenomenal professor. I highly recommend it. And you're probably wondering, Tommy, will you take the um, the Harvard Business School like course thing? The answer is um, I, I might consider it. It's $1,750. It's six weeks. And, and, and it helps just to keep doing and doing and doing, like practicing like all those like discount cash flow formulas and, and all that stuff because that stuff is important, you know, to kind of like fully comprehend it and to do like you can't get tired of doing the right things over and over again until it becomes a part of you. Um, so it's definitely not a book that you read and now you're like an expert. No, you probably got to read this book a few more times and just study the parts that you actually like the most. Okay. Um, peace out. Long-term team out. Um, follow me on Instagram, Tommy Bryson. More videos here. My face is here. Um, peace out.